So on to part three now, and we're going to look at, before we look at hinges and other circular sites, we're going to look at sites in Britain that preceded them uh, to see whether there's any evidence of solstitial or stellar alignments with these. Um, and as these were the precursors to the later ritual sites, if we find evidence here, then um, it's, it's kind of indicative that it was inherent in the culture. So when we find them in hinges, we can see that it's part of an ongoing process. So again, we're familiar with this, this image. Um, if we're looking at some of the um, Neolithic uh, tombs and ritual sites, um, this is predating Stonehenge between about 4000 to 2000 BC. Um, we will bear this diagram in mind, knowing that if we see a lot of orientations in this kind of zone, then we're perhaps looking at solar or lunar orientations. If we see orientations outside of it, kind of in these areas, then there's a possibility that we're looking at stellar alignments. Obviously, of course, there can be alignments along here which are also stellar. So just because they form, they fall within this part of the sky doesn't mean that they're not stellar as well. Um, we'll see that later with uh, alignments on Orion in the Hengias, which are kind of in this direction. Okay, now a lot of work has been done on um, the alignments of certain tomb types in Britain. There's a number of different differing Neolithic tomb types. People tended to be buried in communal tombs, in large communal monuments, tended to be made of stone where there was natural stone resources in the west or of earth and timber in the east in the lowland zone. Um, but um, Richard Bradley um, in his work has suggested that a lot of these tombs um, are derived shape-wise from houses so they, they are literally houses of the dead. It may have been that originally houses were built um, in the early Neolithic period and when people died um, in them the house was just left to rot and collapsed in on itself and became a kind of communal tomb. Um, this may, may have been where the idea of the, the house of the dead came from. So there are shared orientations between houses and tombs. Um, one thing we have to consider, looking at these images here, we can see um, uh, different tomb types, um, such as um, D, which is long bows in Britain. We can see a um, concentration of orientations towards what we would consider solar or lunar positions. But if these structures are, are mirroring ancient houses, well, you know, if you're building a house, what way you're going to have the entrance facing? Do you want it so it gets a sun in the morning? That might be a consideration. Do you want it so it's not facing the west? And if you think the prevailing wind um, in our part of the world is from the west, maybe you don't want your door facing that way. And so maybe that transfers into tombs. And if that's the case, you know, are we looking then at um, orientations on sunrises throughout the year, or is it just a practical consideration that you're building your house facing so it gets a light in the morning and doesn't get any wind in it? You know, you have to, you have to argue for both cases. Um, especially if the tomb then follows the, the design of the house. Of course, it's going to have the, the um, entrance in the same position as your house does. But one thing we do see is that there are a number of, of alignments which are out of that solar line or lunar line. Um, again, not many to the west. Maybe there was some kind of taboo in facing the west. We don't know. Um, but these don't suggest solar alignments. If you're, if you're looking directly north or directly south, perhaps you're looking at something else. Perhaps there are stellar or other heavenly alignments being being used. A man who has done a lot of work on the possible stellar alignments of these ancient sites is 
um, a man called John North. Um, he was a professor of astronomy um, rather than an archaeologist. And he wrote a book called Stonehenge, Neolithic Man and the Cosmos. And he looked at the orientation of a lot of these, especially the long, the long mounds, uh, these long barrows. Now this is um, Fussell's Lodge. Um, this is an earthen long barrow in, in the south of England, I think it's Oxfordshire. And uh, what North did was to look at the, or the orientation of um, the, the wooden chamber, the wooden mortuary chamber inside the monument. So you normally have um, a mortuary chamber at one end and then this kind of long comet-shaped tail almost going back. Some of these can be hundreds of meters long, like the one at West Kennet. So what he was doing was looking at the orientation of the chambers at the end. Now, Fussell's law, um, he uh, argued, aligned on a certain number of stars. Um, the main one being Aldebaran in um, Taurus. Aldebaran is the red eye of the bull. Um, he also said that there were orientations to Deneb, which is in Cygnus, and also, interestingly, to to Beta Crucis, which we, we will look at. This is the Southern Cross. This is one of the constellations which we can no longer see in the northern sky due to precession, but it's obviously still visible in the Southern Hemisphere where it's, um, it's used on the flag of um, New Zealand, for instance. It's quite a marked um, constellation, quite a um, uh, dramatic constellation visibly. So this is my reconstruction of the, the posts within the monument. So we have um, orientations on Cygnus one way and orientations looking into the chamber to Aldebaran, which is, um, let's go better. There we go. That, this is the head of the bull here. I can't really see that. Um, and these are the horns of the bull. There's the red eye of the bull. But of interest is the fact that at, at the end of these posts was an ox skull. It's almost as if they're um, showing that the alignment of, uh, on the stars is on um, Taurus. How old the constellations are, that's another question. Whether people in Neolithic Britain in 4000 BC had the same idea of Taurus that the ancient Greeks did is a, is a moot point, but I, and we haven't got time to go into it, but there is a possibility. Now, um, perhaps his most interesting site is Wayland Smithy, which is a long burrow in Oxfordshire, not far from the White Horse at Uffington. It's a strange kind of wedge-shaped um, barrow. And it has this, these amazing flanking stones outside the main chamber. Now, North used computer software available to available to him in the I think, early 90s, he was writing, um, to show that the chamber seemed to be built um, to um, have sight lines towards, sorry I'll rub that out because I just obscured the text, um, no, sorry, anyway, modern technology seemed that the chambers were oriented on the stars of crooks. Okay, this is the Southern Cross. Now we call it the Southern Cross because um, with our sort of Christian culture, we have defined it in the shape of a cross like so. But um, I do argue that in ancient times, it was probably more likely to have been seen as a kind of diamond or kite shape as we can see here. But anyway, this is this constellation which is in the Milky Way, we cannot see in the night sky anymore, even then in sort of 3700 BC, um, around the time that this tomb was built, um, 
crux was very low in the, in the sky, in the southern sky, so it only sort of rose here and set there. So this is my mock-up of the chamber. So the, the from, if you're sitting inside the chamber of Wayland Smithy, the left-hand side of the entrance is um, defined by the rising point of this side, Crooks. And the other side is defined by the rising of the bottom star. So it's as if the whole entrance is defined on this constellation, which suggests that that constellation for ancient man had a meaning, and it was perhaps a meaning associated with, with death or rebirth, um, with the entrance to the tomb, perhaps an entrance to the world of the dead. Um, so we start to be able to build up a mythology based on uh, based on what stars are being uh, viewed. Here we are. So this is the uh, the image I flipped forward through um, too fast before. Here's the chamber, kind of cross-shaped chamber, and then from the back wall here, the entrance, the size of the entrance is defined by the um, orientation on the rising of these two important stars in the um, constellation of Crux. And there's a possibility that the chamber itself has that cross shape as a reference to these stars, whatever they might have meant. Um, we do have an idea, well I have an idea, which is what we'll talk about later. North also mentions other alignments. Um, these aren't so credible in, in my mind. So we have, um, for instance, the setting of certain stars against the edge of the barrow we went seen from a certain direction. And as he describes at West Kennet um, in, in Wiltshire, that the someone standing on the side here would see Sirius rising over the top of the barrow, sort of along here. I think I've got a diagram of that later. But again, it depends on the height of the um, of the edge of the barrow, which we don't really know. And um, it seems a bit arbitrary. Many go, going back to West Kennet. Um, ah, here is a diagram. So someone standing here would be would see Sirius rising and setting over the barrow. But again, it's a bit I'm not convinced by it. So the chamber itself, but where um, um, you have five chambers pointing towards, um, in in North's view, the speaker, the Pleiades, and um, Beetlejuice, Orion. So this would be the view from the chamber, Beetlejuice, and this towards also towards Alnath, which is the of the ball uh, in Taurus. There's also a suggestion that the, the shape of the chamber um, is that of a bull. So you've got the head of the bull here and you've got the horns of the bull, um, which again suggests the beginnings of a kind of mythology that we can perhaps try to take apart. And the bull is incredibly important in Neolithic cultures from um, all the way from Chattel Hoyok in Turkey through Egypt um, all the way to the prehistoric Britain, so perhaps we are seeing um, evidence of a, of a mythology here. 